Section 4.5, Comparing Expressions and Equations. So we just finished up with section 4.4, and in that section we were solving lots of equations. And we're just going to take a pause here before we move on to talk about the difference between expressions and equations, how you can tell how they're different, and then what that means in terms of the work that you do. So let's look at an example. They want us to identify the items below as either an expression or an equation. And it's actually pretty easy to do. What you want to do is just look for an equal sign. If you have an equal sign, you've got an equation. And if you don't, you've got an expression. So we see the equal sign in part B. So this one is an equation. We look at part A. There isn't an equal sign there. So that one's an expression. And you might be looking at that and saying, yeah, that's obvious. And, and hopefully that's true. But it is pretty common for students to mix up expressions and equations and when that happens you end up doing the wrong work and giving the wrong kind of answer. So I want to go ahead and point out here some of the differences between expressions and equations, how we notice them and then how that causes us to work differently with them. So as we just mentioned, equations begin with an equal sign in them, but expressions do not. And I put begin because usually as you simplify an expression, equal signs will show up. But when the problem first is presented to you, there's no equal sign in it. And then as far as what you're going to do with these things, you can solve an equation and find a solution. But you can only simplify an expression. There is no solution to an expression. Unfortunately, it's fairly common that I would give a problem like the one in part A and ask people to simplify it, and there would be a few students who would at the end say x equals something and present a solution. But if you're starting out with an expression, that would be inappropriate. You would only be simplifying it. There's no solution. And it's not just inappropriate. If you ended up with a solution, you must have made a mistake somewhere along the way. So it's important to know when you start out what your goal is. So if it's an equation, you're going to want to solve it, but if it's just an expression, you're going to want to simplify it, and there is no solution. The other thing that's important is if you have an equation, then you can multiply both sides by the least common denominator, or the LCD, to clear fractions or decimals. I would usually only do that for fractions, but you could also do it for decimals as well. But that means that if you start out with fractions, you have the option to get rid of them if it's an equation. However, if it's an expression, you don't have two sides and therefore you can't clear fractions or decimals, you have to work with them. And I see this a lot. People get used to clearing fractions by multiplying both sides by the LCD, and then somebody gives them an expression and they just multiply everything by the LCD. But if there's not two sides, you don't have that balance, and so you're changing the value of the number and it messes up your answer. So this is something that you can only do when you have an equation. If you have an expression, you're still probably going to find the LCD if there's fractions in there, but that's for the purpose of adding and subtracting the fractions. Because to add and subtract fractions, you need a common denominator. But in equations, you're not trying to add and subtract. You're trying to remove the fractions. So in equations, you find the LCD for the purpose of removing the fractions. So very different. In an expression, we're going to work with those fractions. And that requires getting a least common denominator, changing every fraction to have that least common denominator. In an expression, we want to get rid of those fractions. We'll still use the LCD for, for that purpose, um, but we get rid of them. We don't work with them there. So I'm going to go ahead and show you some examples, and we'll try and spot how we use those facts that were just mentioned. So for each of the following, if it's an equation, solve it. If it's an expression, simplify it. So the very first thing that we want to do, and we don't have to write it down, but we need to at least make a mental note of it on each one of these, is to think about, all right, which type is it that we have this time? And so for part A, I see an equal sign, so that means I've got an equation. And according to our directions up here, if it's an equation, they want us to solve it. So when I go to solve this equation, I'd start out by combining my like terms on the left side. So 2 minus 7 would be negative 5. So I have negative 5x equals 15. And then I'm trying to get this x by itself. The negative 5 is connected by multiplication. So I would divide both sides by negative 5. So those coefficients cancel off, leaving a 1. So I have 1x, or just x. And on the right, 15 divided by negative 5 would be negative 3. So that was an equation. It ends up having a solution. 
When we move on to part B, the first thing I need to notice, no equal sign. If there's no equal sign, then I'm working with an expression. With an expression, I just simplify. When there's parentheses, I would want to clear them. So I'm going to distribute that 2, copy that 6k, and then 2 times k would be plus 2k, and then positive 2 times positive 4 would be plus 8. We have a couple like terms right here, a negative 6k and a positive 2k. Negative 6 plus 2 is negative 4, and those are still k's. And then the plus 8 did not have a like term, so I just copy it over. And I'm done simplifying. I don't have any more like terms, so that's my answer. So notice the difference in the answer between those last two. When we started off with an equation, we got a solution, x equals something. But if we start off with an expression, we just get a simplified expression um, and not a solution. So this type does not end saying k equals some number. Let's look at another one. On part c, which is it? Well, does it have an equal sign? No. So it must be an expression. For an expression, we simplify. For expressions with parentheses, we want to remove those. So I distribute the negative 4. Negative 4 times 2x. Negative 8x. Negative 4 times plus 1. Negative 4. Negative 2 times 3x. Negative 6x. Negative 2 times positive 6 plus 12. Just be careful with the sign there, negative times the negative, so we get a plus 12. And then we have two like terms right there, and two more here, our x terms and our constant terms. So finishing this off, we have negative 8 plus negative 6 would be negative 14x, and then negative 4 plus 12 would be plus 8. And again, we didn't start with an equation, so there's no solution. We start with an expression. We've simplified it by removing parentheses, combining like terms, and so we're done. Let's look at a few more examples of equations versus expressions. In part D here, first goal is figure out, is this an equation or an expression? And simple, as always, look for the equal sign. We have that, so this would be an equation, so our goal would be to solve it. When an equation does have um, the ability to simplify each side, we should do that first. And I notice on the left side here that I have a couple like terms. So I'm going to go ahead and combine those like terms. You could use a calculator. You could do the math by hand. We have 7.2 minus 1.3. Borrow the 1 there. So that would be 12 minus 3 is 9, and 6 minus 1 is 5. Feel free to use a calculator on that if you want, or you can do the scratch work off to the side. So I have 5.9k, and then this piece doesn't have a like term, so I'll just copy that one down. And then on the right-hand side, no like terms there either. This isn't a big deal, but I like to have my variable terms first, so I'm going to do just a little bit of rearranging, and I'm going to move this negative 6.6k to the front, and then plus 20.5. That's more of the mx plus b sort of format, and I'm just used to working with that, and it kind of puts my... Uh, like terms in the same place on the left and the right hand side and I think that's a little bit helpful. It's not necessary but I like to do it. Alright so now we want to get all of our terms with the variable on one side and all of the constants on the other. So I'm going to go ahead and add 6.6k to the right hand side for the purpose of eliminating that term. So since I did that on the right I would do that on the left as well for balance. And then at the same time, I want to go ahead and move this constant term to the other side. So I would do that by adding 4.5. That doesn't actually move it. That cancels it. But when we add the 4.5 to the other side for balance, we have that kind of appearance of it moving over. And then if we combine our like terms here, which we've kind of got lined up already, so that's convenient. Let's see, we'd have a 5 and carry the 1. And then it looks like 12. So 12.5k. Those have canceled. And then on the other side, these have canceled. And this looks like it's going to line up nicely for us. The 5 plus 5 is 10. We carry the 1. We have 24 plus 1 is 25. And then on the last step, I would take whatever the coefficient of k is. I'd want to get rid of that. It's connected by multiplication. So I would divide by that. So those would cancel off or create a 1. If I do that on the left, I'm going to do it on the right as well. So I actually just happened to notice here that 12 and a half goes into 25 exactly twice. So I can simplify that answer in my head and say that k equals 2. If I didn't notice that, it would be fine to go ahead and use the calculator on this. In this uh, class, when we have equations that start off with decimals, 
a decimal answer would always be acceptable. So if you happen to be able to see a nice answer and can do it in your head, fine. But if not, go ahead and feel free to use the calculator because if it's nice, you'll notice that afterwards. If it's messy, you're going to see in my math lab that they're asking you to round that to a certain number of decimal places. So having it on the calculator is fine. And then the last thing to note is we, this was an equation because it started with an equals and we ended up with a solution, which is one of the patterns we want to see in this section. All right, let's move on to another one. On this one, we're starting off without an equal sign, and so that means we have an expression. When we have an expression, we want to simplify. One of the fundamental ways we simplify is to combine like terms. There could be a little bit of a temptation here to get rid of the fractions by multiplying by the LCD of all these, which would see 6, 2, and 4. That would be 12. But you can't multiply by 12 unless you can multiply both sides by 12. And unless you start off with an equal sign, you don't have two sides. So that's not appropriate here. If we want to work with these, we're just going to try and combine like terms. So I'm going to try and combine these two because they both have an x. But to combine, I want to add the coefficients. And this coefficient has a 6. That one has a 4. So I'm just going to, on this first step, I'm going to just rearrange this a little bit. First of all, I'm going to write the x to the side. And we can always do that. If we have 5x over 6, we could pull that off and make it 5, 6x. And then I'll do the same thing for this other x term. That would be negative 3 fourths x. And then the constant term, I'll just copy over. So that did a couple things. It just showed me the coefficients a little bit more clearly. And it also put my like terms together. So I don't need to get a common denominator for all three of these because they're not all like terms. I just need to get common denominator for the ones that I'm going to combine. And for a 6 and a 4, that would be a 12. So I'm going to take that 5, 6, and I'm going to multiply top and bottom by 2 because that would make it a 12. And I'm going to copy the x and do the same thing with the 3 fourths. I want to make that a 12, so I would need to multiply the denominator by 3. I need to do the equivalent thing on the top. Copy the x over, the 1 half is just along for the right. And then let's see, where does that put us? That would be 10 twelfths x minus 9 twelfths x plus a half. And now that I have a common denominator, I can just add the coefficients. And 10 twelfths minus 9 twelfths should be 1 twelfth. So I would have 1 twelfth x and then plus 1 half. And this time we had started off with an expression, not an equation, so it's an appropriate answer to just have a simplified expression, but not a solution. And notice the fractions, we could never really get rid of them. We had to work with them the whole way through, get common denominators, not just see what the common denominator was, but turn those fractions so they had the common denominator and simplify all along the way. I much prefer to see an equal sign when I start off with fractions, because then I know I have the option to clear those fractions if I want to, and I want to. So let's see, we have denominators of 2, 6, 3, and 4, and once again it looks like the least common denominator would be 12. All of these do divide evenly into 12. So I can multiply both sides of this equation by 12. So 12 times 7 halves x minus 5 6 equals 12 times 1 3rd plus 3 fourths x. So I've multiplied both sides by 12 and I'm going to do the distributive property which really means I'm going to multiply every term by 12. So 12 times 7 halves x minus 12 times 5 6 equals 12 times 1 3rd plus 12 times 3 fourths x. And it's important to see here how I used the least common denominator. I did not start trying to change all these fractions to have 12 as their denominator like I did on the last one. This time I tried to multiply every term by 12 and when I do that something I think better than a common denominator happens I have no denominator. It's still a 1 but you know in the visual sense we're not going to have a denominator because we've canceled that off. So the 2 goes into 12 6 times the 6 goes into 12 twice, the 3 goes into 12 4 times, and the 4 goes into 12 3 times. And when we look at what we have left over, sorry, a little mistake here, when you have an equation, it's more appropriate to use this arrow, which read implies, 
instead of an equal sign as you go from one to another. So I had left, right, left, right. This is left, right, so this one should be an arrow. And I'll do the same thing here. And then I have 6 times 7 is 42, and the x minus 2 times 5, so minus 10, equals 4 times 1, so a 4, plus 3 times 3, which is a 9, and the x. And all the fractions are gone. Notice that was never something that happened in the previous example. Because it was an expression, we just worked with those fractions the whole way through. But in this one, we've been able to clear them. And now we can do some easier work on an easier problem. I'll subtract 9x from both sides to get all of my x terms on one side to cancel them on the, the right. I'll add 10 to both sides to get rid of the constant term on the left and move it over to the right-hand side. Doing the work here, 42 minus 9 is 33x. And on the other side, we have 4 plus 10, which is 14. And then just one final step here. We want to get x by itself. Right now is a coefficient of 33, which is a multiplier. So we'll do the opposite and divide there. Do that on the left to get rid of the 33. Do it on the right for balance. The 33s cancel. And I get x equals... 14 over 33. And again, we started with an equation, so it's appropriate for us to have a solution. And just one other thing to mention before we wrap this up. If I was doing this, uh, it's fairly common that I would take a little bit of a shortcut and just go straight down to this line. So instead of writing the 12 in parentheses on both sides, I would know that the effect that's going to have is to just mean I have to multiply every term by 12. So I would be very likely to just start off with this equation, which has four terms, and multiply each of those four terms by 12 right away. That would take out one of the lines and make this a little bit shorter. And I, one last note is that you, we probably would want to leave a fraction for this answer. Just keep an eye out on my math lab. If it says enter a fraction or an integer, enter it this way. If it says to enter it a decimal and gives you rounding directions, then you could go ahead and divide on your calculator. But it shouldn't just be an automatic thing for you to divide. We started out with fractions. We should kind of expect they're going to want a fraction answer. If they want a decimal, then fine. Divide. Otherwise, leave it as it.